for a little extra cardiac cycle. There's a couple of quizzes on the schedule for next week. Um, I decided I'm going to put both of those on Pop for you. I think what I'll do is, I don't know, I'll make them available both Monday. I'll just keep you all week to do them. You can just do them whenever you're ready. A little word of warning. You should study like heck this weekend for this class. I know it's the weekend after exams. You like to go on cruise control and not study. So let me tell you something for lecture exam three. I just graded your last exam. I kind of know student tendencies. You guys are great on lab practical too. The average was a 94. The average was a 94. That's great. She gave you some kind of reward. <laughs> for lecture exam two, it was more normal. It's like the average was like a 79. That's kind of more than I'm used to seeing. But, but anyways, for lecture exam three, the stuff kind of builds on each other. Whatever I teach today and what I taught Wednesday, you should have it mastered by Monday. Um, study for Monday like you had a test. If you really have a strong foundation Monday, I think your chances of getting an A on lecture exam three go up dramatically. If you kind of coast and do, do the classic college cram thing, lecture exam three is not going to go well for you. I just kind of know from experience. Um, but um, So this, this weekend, not next weekend, this weekend is crucial if you want to do well in the next exam. Because if you have a th strong foundation on cardiac cycle, everything else seems to fall in place for you. So I'm just going to submit that for your consideration. I can't control you. But people are always asking, oh, should I study for this test <laughs> the first weekend? I think, yeah, that, that, that's a good time. <clears throat> You know, there's different levels of studying, right? The lowest level of studying that I remember when I was a student, uh, there was no test. I would just kind of be watching a ball game, watching football, and then like reading my textbook during commercials. That's like the lowest, lowest level. So don't do that. I'm saying you should study a little harder than that this weekend. Okay, kick it up a notch. So cardiac cycle. All right, we kind of started it before the break. Um, the cardiac cycle, strictly defined, is all the mechanical events of one heartbeat. So these are the sounds that we hear in the stethoscope, okay? It's the sounds of the heart valves closing. Uh, typical cardiac cycle is about 0.8 seconds. Now it varies, but that's the textbook average, and where do we get that? So basically, <coughs> if one heartbeat is about that long, this way. Beat, one beat is 0.8 seconds. Go like that. Times 60 seconds in a minute. So I'm going for the beats per minute thing, right? The pulse rate. Seconds cancel out. We did the math. 60 divided by 0.8 is 75. Remember that's kind of the average man kind of heart rate kind of thing. Um, so that's where that number comes from. And um, well, we got the diastole and the systole. I, I already mentioned that. 
So things to keep in mind as you study the cardiac cycle. Number one, know that the atria and the ventricle, they both have cycles of diastole and systole. They both cycle through diastole, systole. Oh, I'm sorry. What's wrong with me this morning? Atria and ventricles <coughs> both cycle through diastole and systole. <coughs> Sometimes as I'm thinking, I write what I think, but I'm ahead of myself. But anyways, that's one thing to keep in mind. What we focus on are the ventricular cardiac cycles. If it's not said, it's the ventricular diastole systole that they're talking about. The atria do have diastole and systole, but it's far less important. Also consider the fact that we have right heart, left heart. Usually we teach the left heart, okay? In the cardiac cycle. The other thing to consider is how blood flows during the cardiac cycle. Blood always flows, it's a pressure gradient. It always flows from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Blood flow is dependent upon a pressure gradient. High to where it's lower. So be, be thinking in units of millimeters of mercury. Okay, that rule is always true. Now let's consider the heart valves. You got the AV, you got the SL. I'll always keep track during which phase we're on. Which valves are open, which valves are closed. Open, closed. They can all be closed, but they'll never all be open. That, that's kind of what we'll see. And because we're, we usually teach the left heart, the valves of the left heart include bicuspid and the aortic SL valve. So the reason why I mentioned the valves, that, that picture I showed before the break, that kind of tells you where you're at. You can tell what's going on in the heart by looking at the valves, if they're open or closed. And I'll go through all those phases. Um, so, but basically, to boil it down, it boils down to this and that, diastole, systole, okay, for the ventricles. And uh, the big thing to keep in mind is um, of that point A, the heart spins about 0.5 of that point A in diastole, and about the rest of it in systole. The heart's either relaxed, filling with blood, or it's in a state of contraction, pumping the blood. So what I do is, I've taken pictures of the Atlas and the Mary of text. I think they're both useful in this kind of a lecture. And I'll kind of talk over these pictures and that picture, and I'll talk over my notes here. Things to keep track of during um, one heartbeat. And it's a cycle, and so you can kind of start from anywhere in the cycle and once you get back to where you were, then you're done. So let's start from the point where you must fill the heart with blood before you can pump it. That's usually where folks start. It's called inflow. The filling phase. Yeah, so you can call it inflow or, or ventricular filling. That's usually what I call it.
I'm just writing ventricles filled with blood. I don't know a simpler way to put it. But let's talk about it in terms of uh, pressure gradients. Um, so let me try out some data here. And um, I'm going to plot it against time on the x-axis. <clears throat> and let's keep track of the ventricular volume in units of milliliters on the bottom graph. And on the top graph, let's keep track of different pressures in millimeters of mercury. Okay. And let me put in some numbers here. 50, 120. Let's go, uh, how about 10, 80, 120 in millimeters of mercury. It's a coincidence that it's 120 millimeters of mercury and 120 mils. So that's volume versus pressure. Uh, all right, so usually how we teach about this is if blood is flowing into the ventricles, well, if blood is flowing from atria to ventricles, right? So blood is flowing from, since we're talking about left heart, blood flows from LA to LV. Because that's true, pressure in the atria is slightly higher than ventricles. So how about for left atrium, I, I kind of plot the pressure line. It's going to look like this. Basically, pressure in the atria never really gets that high. Pressure in the um, ventricles, let me get some colors here, hold on. I want to use the right colors, pardon me a second. All right, for blood to flow into the left ventricle, pressure of the LV, I'll use this purple line. I'll draw a little bit lower there. So that's pressure of the um, LV, the left ventricle. Pressure is a little bit lower than the left atria, the black one, LA. That's why blood flows from LA to LV. The pressure is very low in the ventricles at this time. And if you look at our three pictures, diastole has different parts, early, mid, late. Most books usually start from mid-diastole, so let's start there. Mid-diastole, pressure in the LV is lower than the LA and the ventricles are filling with blood. Let's keep track of our valves. The AV valves are open, the SL valves are closed. But because we're only talking about the LV, let's just mention the bicuspid. Bicuspid valve is open, but the aortic semilunar valve is closed. like this on the graph, like that, the line's increasing. You're increasing the blood to fill. Let's just think about it. We want to fill, we want to top off um, the blood so the blood has as much blood available to it to pump. So fill it as much as you can. In late diastole, In 
late diastole, well, of the ventricles, I'll put that in parentheses, you have atrial systole. So I'm writing atrial systole occurs. That contraction of the atria pushes that last bit of blood into the ventricles, topping it off. It's like the last 30% of ventricular filling. That's what I'm writing. Last 30% of ventricular filling. And look at your pictures. I, want to, I take these pictures for granted. I want to make sure you know what you're looking at. They show you right heart and left heart, but which heart are we talking about? Left. You see the black arrows? That means systole. So what does it mean if you don't see black arrows? Diastole. Yeah. These arrows inside the heart show blood flow inside the heart. And they even show valves open or valves closed, so the pictures can be useful. This shows valves open, these valves are closed. Okay, so that's everything I think I have there. And basically the last bit of late diastole, you're gonna finish filling there. So late diastole, you get that little blip. That little blip is from the atrial systole, a little pressure blip. And then you, you kind of finish off the filling you top it off. It usually gets around 120. Okay, that's kind of the textbook average when you finish filling. So um, after diastole, systole, you finish filling, now you're going to pump this blood. But it's very important to note the volume of blood at the end of diastole. It's called the end diastolic volume. So note. This is how much blood is available to pump. The EDV happens to be 120 ml. Okay. So now there's no question, but we'll move on to systole. Systole is the pumping part. The systole has two parts. And the first part is you're actually not pumping, you're just kind of building pressure. Okay. You start to squeeze, and as you build pressure, you will pump. But this is the point where you're squeezing when you haven't started to eject blood yet. Uh, okay, well, here's what's going on. Arterial pressure, well, let's see if you remember. What's the textbook average of blood pressure in the arteries? 120 over 80. Okay, that's usually the textbook average, something like that. So keep that in your mind. That's the pressure in the um, aorta. The reason why you have a pressure drop is when the heart's in diastole, blood is flowing away and pressure is dropping in the blood vessel. So for the um, aorta, pressure is kind of like dropping, 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 something like that. Aorta. Now when systole starts, you have to rise to the arterial pressure so you can pump blood into it. So this is a um, this phase is called isovolumetric ventricular contraction. So let's use red for, for this phase. I use purple for the inflow. If you can remember that long title, you've remembered a lot of information. You know it's ventricular contraction. Isovolumetric, iso means same. 
So the volume in the ventricles is not changing. So the first thing to note is, look at the valves. Are they all open or all closed? All closed. They're all closed. Okay. All the valves are closed. So there's no inflow or outflow. So that's why the volume's not changing. All the valves are closed. All valves are closed. There's no inflow or outflow. Volume stays the same. What is the volume? What was it just prior? 120. So it just stays 120. Whatever the EDV was, that is just staying there. Okay. So let's use red. So how about for red, um, representing this phase, I just extend that volume line just a little bit more. It just stays the same, doesn't change. It stays at 120. But in terms of the pressure, you, you, the pressure jumps up. So it's going to like shoot up. It's going to rise to meet arterial pressure. Let me write that down. Increase pressure, millimeters of mercury, to reach aortic pressure. That's why the red line is shooting up. Now, one thing to note is, as soon as you start squeezing the ventricles, I'm going to say at this point right here, as soon as the ventricular pressure exceeds the atrial pressure, pressure of the LA, put a star there, that's when the bicuspid valve closes. Or both, both valves do, but um, the AV valve's closed, but the bicuspid valve, because it's the LV, bicuspid valve. That's our first heart sound. That's the LUV. That's the lump sound. Because you don't want to squeeze blood back into the atria, right? You want it to go out the artery. So that valve closes, uh, and the pressure continues to rise to meet aortic pressure. That's it. And look at the picture. What do the black arrows mean? Systole. Yeah. Do <coughs> you see how the arrows here? What are these two valves? Bicuspid. Bi, bi tricuspid. Blood wants to flow backwards into the atrium, but these valves close, they make a sound, and they, they keep blood from regurgitating backwards. All right, so let's get to the second part of systole here. But this shows why you need the chordae tendine, uh, chordae tendine in the papillary. When you're filling and you open in, blood just flows, okay? Everything's slack. But when you start squeezing the chamber, the cusp of the valve closes and it keeps blood from flowing backwards. These are contracted and these are very taut. Okay. So that's kind of why you need the chordae tendine. Like pluck them when you get your sheet part. See how tough they are. You can't break them. They're like, they have a lot of tensile strength. There's a picture of a real one in a heart. And when you, um, when, when I have students show it to me, I can always tell the student, yeah, you're kind of not sure. So what you do is you kind of point in a general area. And you don't point to it specifically. And I'm like, hey, where's the cusp? Where's the strings? Where's the muscle? OK, don't just kind of point all loose, loosey-goosey. OK, I'm not going to let that slide. You know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the students will call, hey, we're ready, and I get there, and you guys just look at each other, and you're really not ready. Yeah, when you call me over, you better know your stuff. That's all I'm saying. All right, this is the phase. This is what the heart does. It pumps blood. So this is the phase where the heart is pumping. It's the outflow phase. All phases are important. I guess this one's most important because it's the pumping part. So let's use uh, orange. Alpha, 
or ventricular ejection, that's what we call it. Well, let's look at the valves first. Which ones are open? A, B, or SL? SL. Yeah, so we're talking about the left heart, so the aortic SL valve open. That bicuspid is still closed. You're pumping blood into the arteries, basically. Pump blood into arteries. In this case, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So, uh, hmm. so remember that 120 over 80? 80 is the low number of the arteries, so you're trying to exceed that pressure here. So once you exceed that pressure, let me, let me draw the arterial line first. For the aorta, it kind of looks, it's going to look like this during outflow. So it's something like that, just for the aorta, the black line. But the uh, pressure for the, for the left ventricle, I'm going to use orange here for outflow. It's going to look something like that. You're pushing out all the blood you can in this very short period of time, about 0.3 seconds. Notice how there's a pressure rise and then it starts to drop off as the muscle begins to relax. You push most of the blood out first during this part. It kind of looks like this. Then it kind of trails off, kind of like that. Okay, so that's the outflow. It's hard to differentiate red and orange, sorry, but. Uh, I tried to use a different color so that the outflow looks like it's a different phase. Um, so you kind of um, exceed the aortic pressure. At this point right here, when you first exceed the aortic pressure, the aortic um, SL valve, that's when it opens at that point. That's when it first opens. And it remains open, of course, throughout the entire outflow. So when you're done squeezing all the blood you can out, now you don't squeeze out every drop. The volume of blood at the end of systole is called the end systolic volume. And it's about 50. as volume of blood in the heart at the end of systole. You don't squeeze out every drop. No, let's say, for example, hypothetical, ESV, the end systolic volume, that's the end diastolic volume, well, end, end systolic volume. Let's say the number 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, it keeps increasing. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? If the ESV is increasing, that means by default, the heart didn't push out that much, much blood. That means cardiac performance is decreasing. Maybe you'd see that in a cardiac patient, like a person who's had a heart attack or something. Then it's not good. Well, anyways, let's talk about the volume of blood you did push out between here in here. That's the stroke volume, right? So stroke volume, SV. Equals the EDV minus the ESV. What is it? 
Well, in our case, it's going to be send. That's how much blood you ejected into the arteries. So that's the outflow. Um, you get that pressure rise and get that pressure drop. So at the end of outflow, pressure starts to drop in the ventricles. And um, you know, at some point, um, blood starts to flow backwards in the arteries because pressure in the ventricles is dropping. But before it can actually flow backwards, it closes the valve. Okay. So this is called isovolumetric uh, relaxation. volumetric ventricular relaxation. <clears throat> I'll use green. Uh, well, by the name isovolumetric, the volume does not change and look at the picture. All the valves are closed. That ESV volume won't change. Just kind of like put a little green line there. Uh, pressure is just dropping. point right here. That, at that point is when the aortic SL valve closes. What sound is that? Pressure's dropping. Now, here's what's happening. You get this weird thing called this, this little thing is called the dichrotic notch. You see that in the aortic pressure. Well, let me explain what causes that. So, if you have an artery, um, and the valve is open, and you're pushing blood through it, they call that positive flow. However, what we're saying here, pressure is dropping and blood starts to flow backwards. That's called negative flow. But what happens is blood flows into that sinus space and that closes the valve. And it causes this quick reversal of flow. That restores the positive flow. But that quick reversal causes that little notch, okay, in case you're wondering. You, you should know that, actually. The valve closing, quick reversal, you see it as a dichrotic notch. Boom, done. And basically, pressure just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And uh, well, eventually, pressure will drop below that of atrial pressure. And you'll start filling again. So, um, one full circle here. So at this point, right there, uh, that's when the bicuspid valve opens again. You start filling. So this is early diastole.
So it's shown there by cuspid valve opens. Start filling again. That's what's shown there. Look at the details of the picture. They, they show a little, little puddle, right? That's our 50 uh, ESV, and you just start to fill. Here's a picture of the uh, semilunar valve closed. That's a nice picture. Uh, what I did during the break was, I have all these questions there, but what I thought I'd do is I, I made hard copies, and I'll give you class time to answer them for credit today. I, I think it's a good exercise to do, to have you process some information before you leave. Okay, so I'll give you time to do that after I'm done with these slides. Okay. Well, anyways, what we've drawn there, okay, I didn't make that up, right? It's here from the book. I would say, know this like the back of your hand, okay? I mean, I'm not going to make you like do it from memory or anything, but you should understand it very carefully. Everything you need to know is on here. Uh, the figure from the book, light blue. What is that? Inflow or outflow? What do you think? Inflow, that's when you're filling. Fill all the way. See these like dark brownish? Those are both isovolumetric phases, right? Contraction, relaxation. So what's this lighter brown in the middle? That's your outflow. Everything's here. We drew that, we drew that. Okay, it's all there. There's a blank one you can play with. Do um, you recognize these on the bottom? That's what I used when I went through each phase. So they're all there. They got the valves open and closed. They got the heart sounds lubbed up. They even have the ECG, but I didn't teach that yet, so I couldn't present it. ECG's next. Um, probably not today, though. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think I have time. Well, there's a cardiac cycle for the right and left heart. We focused on the left heart. I just had a quick glance. This is the left heart. This is the right heart. Okay. Well, I guess it's a pretty obvious difference. The pressure here increases to about 120. What if you could ballpark that? What does that look like to you? 30. Like something like 30. So the pressure in the uh, right heart generates is much lower. So I'm going to erase this now. Well, I'm going to erase this. I'm going to keep this on the board here, though. pressure that the LV generates, 130. Uh, 120, I should stick with what I said prior. Some books say 130. I've been saying 120. I'm going to keep that the same. All right, for RV, that's about 30. Well, what about output? What about stroke volume? Well, let me ask you very simply. Is it the same or different for right and left? It's the same. Look at it. 120, 50. 120, 50. It's the same for both. For stroke volume. Okay. So I, I wanted to point that out because it doesn't make intuitive sense, does it? If you generate more pressure, shouldn't you be pumping more blood? Well, intuitively, yes, but really, no. You're going to pump out the same. The right ventricle is always going to match the left ventricle and vice versa. But the right ventricle doesn't have to pump as hard. What organ is it pumping blood to? What organs? Lungs. Your lungs. What are your lungs filled with? Air. Air. Air provides less resistance to fluid flow. Everything else is like water. It's harder to pump against water. For example, go home, get a balloon, and put the balloon in water, and try to blow the balloon up underwater. 
I bet you can't do it because the water puts too much pressure on the balloon. So you have to generate more pressure to pump against the water medium. Okay. Uh, so even though pressure is different, the output is equal. That's very important to understand, I guess, clinically. Like for example, uh, because when the heart, right heart pumps blood to the lungs, doesn't it come back to the left heart? They have to match each other, okay? If they don't, things are gonna get backed up. Let's say you've had a heart attack on the left heart and it doesn't work very well, the left ventricle, okay? It, it gets blood from the right heart, but it, the left heart can't keep up. So what happens? Fluid gets backed up where? In the lungs. They call that congestive heart failure. What's congested? The lungs, yeah. Um, what if you have the reverse problem? What if the right heart's no good? You had a heart attack there or something. Where does blood get backed up? Veins bulging out, oh, uh, that could be an indication. You, you can't return it to the right heart because it can't keep up. So it's very important in a healthy heart that you keep the output equal. Otherwise stuff gets backed up. <clears throat> Uh, here's the cardiac cycle just looked at in a different way. That's why I use purple, red, orange, green. You see it? So what's purple? What was it for when we did it prior? It was info. So well, let me take you through this. I think once they get going on it, you'll, you'll see it's pretty easy. This is the same information as over here, except this time we're just plotting the volume against the pressure. So this is in millimeters of mercury. Okay, let's just go from this point to this point. What they do for A to, A to C. You start it with A, you end it with C. Okay, so volume changed from what to what? It changed from 50 to 120. That's ventricular filling, right? That's inflow. But what about the pressure? It, it didn't change very much. It stayed way low. Because remember, if you're squeezing the heart, you can't fill it, okay? You have to, it has to be completely relaxed, then you can fill it, okay? Uh, that's inflow. Okay, well, let's go from C to D, I guess. I think mine's proportionally not gonna look like that, but who cares, so I need red. This is isovolumetric contraction. Here's a yes-no question. Did volume change? No. Well, what's volume here at point C? 120. What's volume at point D? 
Isn't it still 120? Yeah. But the pressure changed. It jumped from 10 to 8, right? Because you're rising to meet arterial pressure. Um, all right, so then from like goes D to E to F. Oh, I think I used orange for that. Something like that. So for our outflow, we, that's when we push out all the blood, get this pressure rise, pressure drop. We kind of see it here. Pressure rises from like, like 80 to P, drops down to about 100 there. But look at the volume change. We start on this side, we're at 120, and we push it out all the way to 50. So what if I asked you what the stroke volume was? What would you say? That should be 70, yeah. That's the SV stroke volume, in case you're wondering. All right, then, then what do you have? Well, after outflow, you have the dichrotic knots, the valve closes, and pressure drops. From F back to A. Pressure drops from 100 all the way back down to A. That's isovolumetric relaxation. All right, so for that green line, did pressure rise or pressure fall? Pressure fell. Did volume change? No. Well, what was the volume? It was 50 the whole time. It did not change. But once you get back to A, the valve, open, the bicuspid valve opens and you just fill. That, they call this PV loop for short. You can see why it's a loop, right? What's the P? Pressure and the V is volume. So that's what they call these. That's another, another way to study the cardiac cycle. Um, that's why I see on the slide there. If you want to study the cardiac cycle in an animated form, I got one link here. Let me show it to you real quick. What's the best one I've seen? Hit the play button, and it shows you what the heart is doing. It shows the valves opening and closing, right? Open, closed. And then it shows the SL valves open and closed for the right and the left. And as it does that, it goes through the cardiac cycle, what we drew. Okay. And what I like about it is you can stop, you can stop it at any point, and you can go back and forth. You can go forward frame by frame, and you can go reverse frame by frame. So it's a very useful study tool if you want to use it, if you're not sure what's going on. Okay, that was all. Uh, let me get, let me get back to where I was, sorry. Let's see here. All right, so we were here. And uh, here's the type of questions I asked on exams. And what I did was I took all of these and made it into a handout. And I want you to uh, do it together as a um, class activity today. But um, what I do is I, I like point to different parts. And I say, well, what, what part of the cardiac cycle is it? Okay, for, for example, that number two, there's two numbers, that's a mistake. I think you get rid of that one. That little bump, do you remember what I taught for that little bump? That's atrial systole. See where pressure is rising right there? That's isobiometric contraction. From 120 to 70, or 130 to 70, they change the numbers. That doesn't matter. What is it from here to here when you push that volume of blood out? That's outflow. Why did I bracket this right there? That's um, isovolumetric relaxation. That's inflow or uh, diastole, okay? So, you know, that, that's kind of how I do it. And another thing I do is, um, this might be my favorite question on the test. I just show you that picture, right? 
and then I make you match it with this here. Like, for example, what would you match with this outflow picture? Number five. So you got to put a five right there. So that tells me uh, two things. Number one, the student knew what that was. Number two, the student knew what that was. So it's, it's my favorite matching. It's um, this one right here. You know, every time I have a test, there's kind of a, a litmus test. There's a, there's a question I ask, and I know if the student has got this down, they probably got an A on the test. This is that. If you can do this, you're, you're probably going to get an A. Uh, I don't know. It's just one of those questions where it's like, it's an indicator of how you did on the rest of the test, this kind of a question. I have some questions here. Which valves open or close at? One, two, three, four. I always ask that. And for the PV loop, we had, we had our segments, right? And we kind of went through what it was, and I kind of described it there. And uh, we also talked, oh, I didn't know if I talked about this. Okay, well, let's do this one together for now. I'll tell you this, at A, something opens. So you can start filling. What do you think that is? Bicuspid valve opens at A. When you start pumping blood, something closes. Bicuspid. It closes, so you don't get that regurgitation of blood backwards. Pressure rises. At D, something opens for outflow. Aortic SL valve opens. And then, when you're done with outflow, that valve closes. Okay? So it makes intuitive sense. Spend some time thinking about it. 